Hey everybody, I moved to Austin, Texas. On today's episode, I'm gonna dive into why I moved and what that means for you, the listener. Listen everybody, we all know that real estate is the most proven way to build wealth. But why isn't everyone wealthy from real estate then? It's hard to know where to start and most of the education out there is just complete trash and you end up investing your money on a series of courses instead of in real estate. That's not how this podcast works. We give you the blueprint to successful real estate investing and bring on guests actually willing to share their secrets. I started my real estate investing journey as a freshman in college when I bought my first duplex and have been in the trenches doing deals ever since. And today, I now own hundreds of millions of dollars of investment property. On this podcast, you will learn what you actually need to know to be a successful active or passive real estate investor. And we'll offer our takes on what's happening today so you can navigate this market and build wealth. I'm Drew Brenneman, and this is the Brenneman Blueprint. All right, welcome back to another episode of the Brenneman Blueprint podcast. So before we get started today, I just want to mention this podcast has really grown a lot, uh, especially in 2023. I've gone on uh, 30 podcasts or so as a guest and have another 10 or so scheduled as a guest. I did uh, uh, a paid ad campaign too, a um, bunch of different things. So, so much growth uh, that's happened with the podcast. So, really appreciate everybody listening. It's really kind of fun to see this this grow and turn into more than just uh, you know me me talking to my my buddies. So, um, yeah, really appreciate that. If you if you haven't or even or if you have, I mean, continue to uh, share this with people you think would be interested, and also. You know, like and subscribe um, anywhere you can do that on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever. And also, if you can leave a review. So leaving a review, uh, you know, especially a written one on Apple really helps. I think most of the people are consuming the podcast on on Apple. And then, you know, we're over 100 reviews now. So when you look at different podcasts, you know, just you see the, what are the reviews like and how many and kind of size it up before listening. And also the more reviews, the more downloads a podcast gets, the more it's pushed out in front of other new people by Apple or Google or whoever, Spotify. So whatever you could do there to help, I would really appreciate it. But without any further ado, you know, I, I moved to Austin, Texas. So I moved at the end of at the end of April. So I haven't, um, I mean, probably quite a few of you have heard if I've gone on other, you've heard me on other podcasts or maybe come up in some of the episodes, but I haven't done an episode of the Brenneman Blueprint really talking about about moving. So I wanted to do that today. Um, so really to kind of set the stage, it's really, I mean, it's it's a work and a personal move. You know, I guess to kind of start on the personal side first, you know, I've always wanted to live outside the Midwest and especially I've always wanted to live in California. And, you know, I've always, um, every winter, I mean, probably since I was like 17 years old, I look around and I'm like, why am I still in the Midwest this, uh, you know, I don't see the sun in January or February or, you know, uh, for a long, long run of time, uh, living in, uh, you know, cause I've lived in Wisconsin, Minnesota and Chicago basically. And so the weather's not that different in those three places. Um, although it is a bit colder in Minnesota than the other two, but, um, anyways, yeah. So, you know, I basically just skipped a step instead of moving to California first and then moving to Texas like uh, like everybody in California. I just I just went straight to Texas. So, um, you know, my sister has lived in Austin since 2014, you know, with her with my brother in law and their their daughter. Uh, so I kind of knew what Austin would be like. And then, um, you know, in Chicago, too, I would kind of joke around with people like if I ever moved to the suburbs, you um, you know, maybe it'll be the suburbs of like a different city. Like I'll be kind of ready to make like a bigger move. And that's what I did. So now I'm out and I'm technically still in Austin, but I'm, you know, out on the border of the suburbs here out in, out in the Hills on the West side. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, on the personal side, yeah, I mean, Chicago is really, uh, really a cool city, you know, it's on par. Uh, I was actually, I was just in, uh, Europe. I was in Lisbon, and then went to Marbella, Spain. And when I was in Lisbon, I was looking up like, do they have any of the top works of art, you know, in the world to go see? Because that's like a cool thing I like to do if you're in Paris or London or somewhere in Italy where they, you know, or New York where they have most of these top works. Um, and yeah, nothing in Lisbon. But what's you know as interesting as you know, I think two of them were in Chicago. So just kind of uh, you know interesting thing to to see, to kind of compare Chicago, you know, it's not, it's not Austin, um, at all. 
um, you know, Chicago is more on par with the, like, you know, London, Paris, New York. So not, um, I'm looking for something a little different at this point though. I mean, something that's less expensive, less of a grind, uh, you know, Chicago to go out to the suburbs, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a grind. So if you want to go golfing or boating or anything, it's not, um, you know, for let's say personal stuff, it's, it's not easy, uh, in Chicago, whereas in Austin, uh, you know, I can do all that and it's like 10 minutes to those things. So, and then, I mean, more importantly than like maybe hobbies, I mean, in Chicago, you know, the crime, all of you guys probably hear about, you know, nationally, it's, it's, uh, it's every bit as bad as what you hear or, or worse. And it was just kind of inching closer and closer to, to, to me and my family, you know, where um, I have a five-year-old uh, son, I think many of you know, and then I, I also have a, a girlfriend and a, and a, an ex-wife. And so we, we all, all of us moved to Austin too, by the way. So we're all here. Um, and, you know, but just, you know, you think a lot about safety when you have a kid and obviously uh, for your own self, but especially if you have a kid and just kind of like the crime was just inching closer and closer where a car got, uh, stolen or carjacked i'm not really sure on the particulars uh from the daycare where he went to daycare in chicago so another parent had their car taken and then um a uh, a friend of someone who works for me he um he was kidnapped and brought from like atm to atm to atm to atm around the south side till they took all of his money um so like you could only hear so many of those stories till you start thinking like when could this be me or someone that i uh, you know, in, in my family. So, um, you know, that, so kind of just a combo of a lot of things, just access to hobbies, ease of living, safety and, and weather really, you know, like on the, on the personal side. And, um, it's interesting too. Now I'm in, uh, shoot recording this in July here. I'm in the teeth of the, uh, the, the Texas summer. And I think, you know, I would rather, um, looking at my screen right now, it's a hundred degrees, uh, you know, at four o'clock in the afternoon here. And it's, it's a lot less uncomfortable being a hundred degrees than, uh, um, than in the winter in Chicago when you have this, you know, zero degrees and you're, it's, it physically hurts you being in the cold. So I know everyone's, you know, um, probably wonders like, okay, now you got to something else bad to deal with weather wise, but I'll, I'll take the heat, uh, any day over, over the cold. So, and I kind of got acclimated to that, I guess now going to Phoenix so much too. So, um, so yeah, I would, uh, I take this July hundred degrees, uh, over the cold in Chicago or Wisconsin, any, any day. I mean, where, you know, where you go, you can go boating and still do fun stuff here. You're just going to need to take a, um, you know, hop in the shower after obviously with the, the heat, but, um, so yeah, so I would definitely make that trade and I did. Um, and then, I mean, I, as importantly, I guess on the work side, I mean, Chicago is like, it's, they're basically doing everything they can to make it tough to run a business there and uh, make money in real estate, you know, short of uh, enacting rent control, which thankfully they haven't done. But the crime, uh, the higher and higher taxes, uh, they just have a new tax now on uh, software. So, you know, if you are in Chicago, um, this isn't why we moved, obviously, but it's just another thing to that I'm saving on now. You know, if you are buying software and you're in Chicago, you have to pay sales tax on that most anywhere else, there's still no sales tax on software. It's like a service. Um, like when you pay your attorney or CPA, there's no sales tax on that either. But in Chicago, they started a software tax, but now I you know now we're in Texas. So there's one thing we don't need to worry about anymore. And, and then, uh, I mean, but more importantly on the real estate side, the, the assessor Fritz Kage, like he has, um, he got elected like 2018 ish and you know, he just has in, injected so much uncertainty into the real estate market, how you value deals, how you underwrite things. And, and then you have, so everyone's just underwriting sort of worst case scenarios for taxes. Um, sometimes that happens, sometimes it doesn't, but it's been, it's just the uncertainty has made it really difficult to invest there. And, and then also too, you, you sometimes you get a really good outcome on your building and then you, you're kind of one of the lucky ones. Other times you get, um, you know, a, a bad outcome. I mean, that sounds too simple, but it's like, I would rather just have certainty and kind of know here's how the taxes are going to work. You know, like in California, they just move you to your purchase price. For example, in Minnesota and Wisconsin, same thing. And if Phoenix, they have a 5% per year assessed value cap. I think that's in most Arizona. I'm only in the Phoenix area. So at least in all of, 
the the Phoenix uh, MSA. That's how it works. And so, like, I like the systems in those other in the other states, uh, you know, where it's a little more certainty. And then we'll get into what we're going to be doing in Texas. But in Texas, you have a lot more uh, certainty on where your taxes start as well. Um, they don't mess around with growing the taxes here. They they um, the property taxes are high in Texas, kind of like Illinois, but Texas has no state income tax, so you're you're getting something, you know, if you will, for the high property taxes. You're you're getting no income tax. So, I mean, it's really just that uncertainty has made it hard. I still will do deals in Chicago. I'm not also I'm not selling everything too. If that's something people are wondering, I have sold off a bunch of the like smaller deals that we, you know, anything that was like one to three million dollars were we have sold in the last couple of years or where we have it on the market or are going to sell it at some point. But that's really more from like a time usage standpoint, where is it worth our effort to run a five unit anymore, you know, or a six unit, you know, not, not really. So a lot of those are getting uh, put on the market and sold. Or if we think, I guess, like a deal's tapped out, you know, value wise and the rents are kind of capped, capped out uh, seemingly, then, then that's why we would sell. So we're not just going to dump everything in Chicago and, you know, we still understand the market really well. And for like a, the right deal where we can go in and just sort of make our money on the purchase where we know we can buy it right, then raise the income pretty much immediately. Then that that's those deals we're still going to do. It's just, you know, by and large, I want to personally be going all in on the Sunbelt, you know, where we have all these tailwinds, you know, where you have all the people moving to Arizona and to Texas and to Florida and the Carolinas and Tennessee and Georgia. Like I'd rather be investing in those places. So I wanted to position myself in the middle of all that. You know, I'm in the middle of the Sun Belt now. So going to Phoenix is quick. Going to other places is fast. I can drive up to Dallas in a couple hours. Um, so, like, that's that's how I wanted to do that. And, and you've seen a lot of other Chicago investors do the same thing. Maybe not move out, but, you know, from Fifield Companies to Magellan to Sterling Bay. All those big developers, they had almost no projects outside of Chicago when Fritz Kage was elected in 2017, 2018, whenever that was. They then since then, they have really diversified. I don't know if it's just a coincidence or if they looked around and go, wow, we don't want to hang our hat on something just solely that has this much uncertainty. Let's still do deals in Chicago. But all those companies expanded to other cities like Miami and Nashville and just all over. And that um, I have to think is a big reason why because of the the uncertainty. So um, and then long term too, Illinois, Cook County, Chicago, they have just these huge pension and tax liabilities that they they need to figure out and they're not really doing anything to improve it so you know in terms of fiscal health illinois is always ranked basically at the bottom you know new jersey and illinois are always the two worst states fiscally uh, on any of those like top 50 rankings and also one you know a poor state to do business in when you look at that and then you know texas is always in the top you know, five, let's say, depending on what list you look at. Sometimes it's number one, sometimes it's number five. But so like Texas, there's just so much to like about it. No state income tax, none of that software tax stuff I was talking about, um, you know, population growth, uh, job growth. I mean, it's always in number one to number five, depending on what list you're looking at for job growth. Uh, Austin has had the highest job growth and population growth of any city its size or larger doesn't matter what list you look at austin's always number one when looking at those larger cities and what we found in our analysis is long term the most th the thing that was the most indicative of price appreciation was job growth in population growth not in raw numbers like who what area has the most jobs and population because that's going to be your just the bigger ones it's going to be houston and dallas and Miami, just all the biggest Sunbelt cities, but as a percentage. Um, so even though less people might move to Austin than uh, Dallas, like Dallas, Fort Worth is seven or eight times bigger than Austin. So um, you really need to look at it more as a percentage. And when you do that, Austin is always has always been number one the last uh, at least five years. So that's, um, you know, from like a real estate standpoint, too, like in uh, when I first got started, you know, 2005, let's say. You'd look back at like the uh, these market reports that the brokerage firms put out. So they're ranking all the different markets across the country, not like what's the best apartment market down to like the you know the worst. Um, 
And it was always the gateway markets were number one. The whole time I was coming up in school and, you know, until about 2010, 2012, it was always, you look back from like 1990 to 2012, it was just kind of, uh, what do you want to call it? Flip flopped, you know, between it's either San Francisco, New York, or sometimes LA. Those were always the top three markets. And, you know, because they had huge inflows of people, uh, it's hard to build in all three of those places, or, you know, the, at least the government makes it hard to build. It's not physically hard. Um, or I guess, you know, earthquakes and not a lot of space in some of these, but they just the government makes it difficult to get anything built there, which then less supply that will, you know, push prices up because you have, uh, you know, a lot of demand fighting for, you know, not that many new units or existing units relative to the um, the people moving in. But about in 2012, 2013, the, the whole dynamic shifted where the biggest growth in rents and in values was no longer in these gateway markets. It was not in New York or Washington, D.C. or Boston or L.A. or San Francisco anymore. So for the last 10 years, it's been the Sun Belt. It's been, you know, cities like Phoenix, Dallas, Austin, Nashville, Raleigh, Charlotte, Atlanta, Tampa, Jacksonville, Orlando, Miami, all these places, I, um, like that's where the growth has been. And just like, you know, Wayne Gretzky says, you know, I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get in front of the trend, even though it's already been going on for, for 10 years. I'm not uh, the first person to move to Texas uh, to invest in real estate by any means, but I'm trying to, you know, I'm not still not that old, you know, I'm in my 30s, so I'm trying to get, you know, in have the tailwinds and the trends sort of at my favor for the rest of my career versus, you know, investing in the Midwest. It was they either the market was not helping you at all or it was was hurting you, depending on the year and where we were uh, buying, I guess. So um, that's kind of my my thought there where, you know, there's been this big shift and it's it's continuing. You know, a lot of people were thinking like, oh, this is work from home or because of um the pandemic or whatever, but it's really not any of that. It's uh, this has been going on for 10 plus years. It's just, it's just continuing to happen. Um, these big cities on the coast are just doing things to push jobs and people out. And the Sun Belt is taking full advantage of that. And which is kind of odd in a way, because, you know, what about global warming and all these different things? You think people would be moving more to the Midwest, but just the economic climate and the way things are in a lot of those places, it's not, um, you know, it's not as business friendly. So then there people are moved to where they're, they have jobs. So then they're not moving cause there's not jobs there. And then obviously the weather, uh, despite global warming is still more fun to live in, uh, you know, Florida or Texas, you know, than than uh, <laughs> than somewhere in the Midwest most of the year. So, um, but so anyways, I mean, so personally, you know, I'm going all in on the Sun Belt, And so, you know, the next markets for Brenneman Capital, you know, are going to be Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, and then continuing to invest in Phoenix. So like I said before, if there is a sweet deal in Chicago or Minneapolis where I already own deals, would I buy it? Of course I would. Am I going to sell everything in Chicago or Minnesota now that I'm moving? Definitely not. It's really more of just a hold what you got. And and then if there's any you know, sweet deals that come up where you can know you're making it, where you're not relying on the market to do you any favors, you know, we will still buy those. So um, I think that's really, really it. Um, I do, I will get into what we like about the markets. I think that would make sense where, um, you know, I've talked a lot about Phoenix, I bet on other podcasts, but not so much about Dallas or Austin. Uh, so I want to kind of talk about why we are investing where we are, I think. So starting out with Phoenix, like the number one predictor for past, uh, excuse me, future performance with rent growth or with, you know, price appreciation is the past performance. You know, things are, like I said, the last 10 years, um, look at the data. Phoenix has been the number two city uh, to Sacramento on rent growth. So since 2013 to 2019, so I, I like to do, look at it this way to kind of, um, ignore the uh the pandemic boost if you will so from 2013 to 2019 in phoenix prices on multifamily appreciated 14.4 percent a year this is the compounded annual growth rates rent growth was 7.3 percent a year so again ranking number two um just behind uh, sacramento uh if you want to go further back for the appreciation from two th year 2000 to 2019 it's the appreciation has been 7.4 percent 
in the rent growth, the farthest back data we could get was 2005. So 2005 to 2019, the rent growth was 4% a year. So this has been just, I know a lot of people like to think, okay, Phoenix has been really hot the last couple, you know, 2020, 2021, you know, rents were growing 20% a year. It's just been a, uh, a near term thing. I didn't even include those years in what I just read off. Like that's been, um, uh, so like it's been going on a long time. You know, if you could get 4% rent growth from 2005 to 2019, uh, that's pretty dang good. And you have all these uh, tailwinds at your back and, and, you know, the global financial crisis rents weren't growing in Phoenix. So that's 2005 to 2019. There's some, you know, we're, we're some rough years buried in there. So, um, you know, it's been uh, over the long haul, been a good market and the benefit benefits from all the population and job inflows, you know, from uh, its, its neighbor, California. So it's, it's as it sounds like when you're in Phoenix, like everybody who's a new person moving in, they are just leaving California because of the uh, costs there. The, there's the whole political environment. And I don't think that's changing anytime soon. So, I mean, that's why Nevada, Arizona, I mean, really all the states around it that are not the, um, the ones having the same issues like, yeah, Seattle and or Washington and Oregon, I'm not. Uh, that hot on because it suffers from a lot of the same issues as California, but Utah, Colorado, uh, Arizona, Nevada, it really benefits a lot from California's mismanagement. So um, we've liked that. I still like it. It's, it's diversified the economy and job market a lot. I mean, a lot of people know it just as like a, you know, a, cons- a market for just for having, um, you know, construction and, and hotel jobs. Basically, it's not like that anymore. So there's a lot of banking and just other uh, other types of industries there now. It's much more than just construction and hospitality. And Arizona has the most favorable property tax set up in the country. So they have this thing called Rule A, where real estate tax assessments have a 5% increase cap per year on them. And properties are not reassessed on sale. So if you are an active investor you you already know what that means it means a tremendous amount where you can you have complete tax certainty on what it's going to be if your bill is uh ten thousand dollars you know it's going to be at most ten thousand five hundred the next year unless the tax rates change significantly and then you um you also have um and it doesn't and it's not since you're not chasing the sale you get a huge uh, chasing the sale meaning if i were to buy a property for 10 million the assessed value just goes to 10 right away like a lot of places that's nice for tax certainty for the buyer and seller but if i raised the rent a ton create a lot of value and i paid 7 million for that now i'm selling it for 10 and the next buyer goes well my property taxes are going to be based on a 10 million dollar building you don't get as much uh as much value created in that scenario where your taxes are going to change for the next buyer because they're looking at what their tax bill is going to be. So in a place like Arizona, you, you end up creating more value uh, with your value add deals because the taxes aren't changing as much. So uh, case in point, like the, um, I have a $30 million deal in Phoenix. Our annual taxes on that deal are $38,495. I have a, $33 $33 million deal in Chicago in the West Loop neighborhood. And the annual taxes on that are $525,000 a year. So on one, you also, you're growing a much smaller number, but in, and then you have, again, that certainty. So the next buyer would go like, my taxes worst case are, you know, 39,000 something on that Phoenix deal in Chicago, who I don't, that's uh, anybody's guess what they're going to be next year. And uh, I mean, on that deal, they're probably going to be lower. So it's just, it's kind of all over the, the board and then the next year is probably going to go up a lot like it's um so it's it's great from a tax uh how the tax laws work where you when you create value at the property you don't have any of it eaten up really by uh your next buyer tax analysis and then i know everyone likes to knock the um the the supply of new apartments coming and a couple things on that i mean there's if you look at it on a national average, yeah, Phoenix has more apartments under construction as a percentage of available inventory than the national average, but it's also growing way faster than almost anywhere. So uh, Phoenix right now for, this is the Q1 2023 CoStar data, 
has 9.42% of units under construction, uh, units under construction as a percentage of existing stock. The Sunbelt average is 7.68, and the national average of the 52 largest markets is 6.49%. So that's, I mean, being in the seven something percent for the Sunbelt and then six for the nation being at nine uh, for how fast it's growing, that's not, um, you know, that doesn't, doesn't make me worry um, much. You know, obviously it'd be great if it was um, at the national average, but it's growing much faster. So you're not going to expect that. Uh, a lot of people just see, oh, wow, 9% or the raw number, which is tens of thousands of units because it's a, it's a very large MSA. Um, and, and so the, they get, maybe they see that and they get spooked, but it's not, I don't, I haven't, um, we haven't witnessed firsthand on our properties either being impacted by new supply. A lot of the stuff we're buying is more of like a class B type property where maybe, um, or one example actually I like to talk about a lot because it's literally across the street. One of the buildings we bought lofts on third uh, in in downtown Phoenix, It the two bedroom, one uh, two bath units there rent for, uh, when we bought it, 1845 when we bought it a year ago. Now they rent for uh, 1935 So we've had 5% rent growth too, kind of on the spot rent, just kind of year to year. And uh, so despite kind of the headline saying rents are down or rents are flat, like on that one, we've grown uh, rents. And then also, so, but across the street, there's a two or three year old building and they have two bed, two bath units there, obviously, but those rent for almost $2,800. So at what point it does new supply really impact this lofts on third building we own if the new ones are going to be at least at twenty eight hundred dollars or more and we're charging nineteen hundred. I mean, it's it's your you're catering to different people. So I think it depends on the kind of deals you buy uh, as well. And when you want to think about new supply and at least the things we've been buying that, you know, are these buildings built in like the 80s or 90s that then can do have some sort of renovation. Uh, done to them to improve the income even more in the rents. Like those are not, uh, you know, they're just at a price point where they're not really bumping up against competing with new stuff. So I think that's, um, you know, that's kind of my, my thought on Phoenix and then why Dallas and why Austin, I think kind of, I mean, first and foremost, it's the resiliency. So, I mean, like Phoenix, it is a volatile market. So like that's the growth market. Um, that I'm picking because it has so much high growth and uh, uh, the way the taxes work are, f are phenomenal. And that's kind of a new, a new law. I think it passed in 2015 or 2016, the Rule A. So uh, not to say Dallas and Austin aren't growth markets. I mean, those are, they're booming too, obviously. But in terms of like uh, some of like uh, let's Phoenix, Las Vegas, Atlanta, most all the Florida markets, they're they're some of the more volatile markets in the country. So meaning they go up and down. Um, it's like, and so, you know, and I guess the, which Florida ones really Tampa, Orlando, Jacksonville, Miami, all the big cities, they, they have a history of, of volatility. Um, and so I don't want to pair that up with them to say, okay, great. We're going to do Phoenix in Vegas and my, you know, and Atlanta and have all these really volatiles have these volatile markets. So, Dallas and Austin, what's great about them is they have, when we look back at all the Sunbelt markets, they're the most stable for prices. So apartments and uh, values and home values are very highly correlated. Uh, I believe the correlation was like 0.7 when we did a podcast on that, but that's, um, I don't have that in front of me, but so very highly correlated. And we went back and we looked at the uh, Zillow data for in the global financial crisis, like what, what did stuff drop to from peak pricing to trough in each market. And then just to make it simpler, we said, now, what would that look like for a hundred dollar, hundred dollars of home value? So let's say you have a hundred dollar house at the peak in, in uh, Austin, what did it drop to? And in Austin, it dropped to $92 only. So only 8% down. So, and then Dallas, it was $90. So 10% down peak to trough. Where in some of these other markets, it was down 30, 40%. So it, it was very, uh, very resilient. And then also to started coming back, uh, the quickest out of any market really was, uh, Houston, Austin, and Dallas were some of the first markets out, uh, 
uh, having positive price uh, price growth coming out of the GFC. So you know, especially in a time like the like right now, I mean that makes a lot of sense. And two, when I talked about kind of the uh, passing of the guard sort of on these core markets where it's no longer New York and LA and San Francisco regarded as just the blue chip, bulletproof, fastest growing, best markets, really Dallas is taking that position. Where Dallas, Dallas Fort Worth is the fourth largest MSA in the in the country, and that's really becoming the uh, the the gateway, the institutional market where you're seeing just so many foreign buyers, industri- uh, institutional money that normally was just in these gateway markets is all in DFW. So and they and same with Austin, they all want Austin. Austin's kind of small for for them, so it's hard to get their money in, but they're all in DFW. So it's really it's like a core market, you know, being very large, very liquid and very stable. Um, but it, it's a growth market. It's in the Sun Belt. It's one of the fastest growing MSAs in the country for jobs and for population uh, that the same apartment supply dynamic that I was talking about with Phoenix. Uh, Dallas right now has be- less units under construction than the, than the national average and the Sun Belt average. The Q1 CoStar data. Uh, has 6.25% units under construction as percent of existing stock uh, versus the Sunbelt average of 7.68 and the national average is 6.49. Um, and two, also, I guess I'll point out, uh, I didn't with the Phoenix numbers, but makes it's worth noting here, like a lot of these projects that are in the CoStar system for that are uh, that are being being built, they're just approved. They're still trying to get their debt and equity together. And I think a lot of these will, they're not financially feasible anymore now with interest rates being in the sixes or sevens on construction loans. Uh, So then those deals don't make sense anymore financially because you're paying more interest while you're building on your construction loan. And also because rates are higher, you you need to put in more equity because it supports, because based on the building's projected income, it only can support a certain amount of loan payments. And if the interest rate goes up, on the assumed loan, but you can only pay the same fixed amount at max on your loan, then you got to borrow less. So now because you could have to pay a higher interest rate and borrow less, then you got to put in more equity. That makes the, if you put in more equity on the same deal, that makes the returns lower. So a lot of these deals are not getting their debt or equity anymore. So I, I would venture to say that, you know, it seems like a quarter to a third of the projects that are, you know, um, counted as under construction are not gonna not gonna happen. So I think by the time all the stuff that's under construction actually gets built and finished, you know, let's say by 2025, there's just gonna be a complete dearth of stuff being delivered in 2026, 2027, probably in 2025 too, where uh, I bet we're gonna see huge, huge rent growth in the Sun Belt in 2025 and 2026, because there's just not gonna be uh, any new supply coming compared to who's moving there. And we're gonna have a lot of pent up demand of people, renters being on defense that uh, right now, if you're worried about losing your job or you lost your job or you're getting crushed by inflation, you're on defense. And they're only gonna, I don't I don't think people are gonna be like that forever. So I think, um, you know, in 2025, when, every, when all the people that moved into their parents' basement are gonna come back out again, that's, um, they're gonna be hitting right at a time where there's no new supply and you have all the usual move-ins to these uh, booming cities. So um, I think it's, that's gonna be really a, good, um, really a good spot to be, you know, now and in the next, you know, two, three, four years. Um, what else is there on Dallas? Um, you know, over the last 15 years, the appreciation, too, of Dallas has been well above the national average. They so have that stability and you have high appreciation. It's had strong and steady GDP growth, five-year GDP growth percentage above the national average every year from 2006 to 2020. Uh, it's a, a whole half standard deviation above the national average. And then, too, I don't have this in front of us, but in our market model uh, where we have all the... Um, uh, the national, uh, the appreciation for every market compared to the national average. I don't, there's not a year where Dallas and Austin were below average since, um, I think that's even like on our screen and it's like beyond like, uh, since the GFC for sure. And then at some point before that, maybe. So it's like, since like 2005 or so, um, that's not exact. I'd have to pull it up, but it's been 
always been a, such a strong outperformer, uh, really that whole time. Um, what I'm saying about the GDP growth is the same. The multifamily prices were doing the same thing. So call it like 2006 to 2020. Um, I have the exact amount up on our blog. I remember when I put that in the paragraphs. So if you want to see the exact amount, check out our blog on uh, on Dallas and then our blog on Austin. We'll have it. Um, but I didn't didn't throw it in the notes for the the podcast. And then lastly, why Austin? I mean, Austin has been head and shoulders above all the markets in the U.S. in terms of the demographic and economic indicators that are most predictive of appreciation. So I think I think I already mentioned these, but the population growth, the job growth and the GDP growth, those were the things that were the most uh, predictive of price appreciation. And uh, for Austin, the five year population growth from 2000 to 2022, when you look back on the trailing five years, it was a full two and a half standard deviations above the national average. So that was number one out of all the markets by a lot. The next best one was Raleigh for that one, I believe. And that was like one standard deviation. So it was not only was number one, but it was number one by like more than double, you know, in terms of the growth rate. And then same thing for job growth uh, over the same time period from the year 2000 to the year 2022. Uh, the five-year job growth trailing, that was an average of 1.9 standard deviations above the national average. So again, number one. And then um, for the five-year GDP growth from 2006 to 2020, that was, that was number two uh, of all markets. Well, they, actually, the number one market was San Jose, uh, where just the whole tech industry was so strong for so long that over that time period, that was number one. But a lot of that tech shifted to Austin now. So um you know, being number one in population growth and job growth for 22 years um, says a lot about a market. So it's not just like a, a, a pandemic bump, like a lot of people were saying. It's the trailing five year population growth and job growth from the year 2000 to year 2022. So 22 years has been number one. So I like uh, betting on something like that, where when we looked at Chicago or Minnesota or some of these other places I've been, they were they were always at the bottom. So it was, you know, if we had 37 markets in our model at the time, you know, uh, it was no, no exaggeration. You know, Chicago is always in the in the high 30s, you know, just always at the bottom. So now now we're uh, kind of getting in front of the trends and having a lot of tailwinds uh, with with the markets we're picking. Austin, obviously, too, a lot of other stuff to like about it. State capital. A uh, large university with the U University of Texas here, so that offers a lot of resiliency in terms of jobs and and uh, and also the population. It has this cool factor uh, where it's it's interesting being here too. Like a um, when I everyone that I've met in Austin, they no one said a bad thing about it. And I know this is just totally anecdotal, but you know there's something to be said for that. Where if everybody likes being somewhere or people want to move there. Like that's a huge benefit to it. I, I remember seeing Elon Musk talking on like a YouTube video clip that I saw, and he was saying what talking about why they picked Austin to relocate the headquarters for Tesla, and there it didn't there wasn't like any data that he provided. He just said everyone wanted to move to Austin. Like that was if you're coming from the Bay Area, where it's like another cool hip area that you could go where it's more business friendly, and it, and it was Austin. So uh, I, rem I remember hearing that. And then also, too, you, we've had so many relocations of headquarters and uh, different jobs that have been announced to, to Austin, to Texas, that a lot of those haven't even happened yet. So even though maybe in 2021, a company says we're going to move our headquarters, that might, not that might happen in like four or five years. So there's still so many more announced but not completed jobs. Uh, corporate relocations like that's going to be um, just a huge tailwind for a long time for Austin and also for Dallas. So and then lastly, the the only knock really on Austin that you can have from the apartment standpoint is that a lot of this stuff is priced in. The cap rates are low in Austin uh, because everyone everyone who has is looking at the data knows what I've just told you. It's number one last 22 years for the two most important things. And and so that's you have to you know that's a little bit priced in so it's harder to make deals work here but i think being local is going to be a huge advantage for us and then also right now near term there's a lot of supply being built of single family homes and also apartment buildings the supply the units under construction as a percentage of existing stock in austin is 15.79 percent right now and again sunbelt average 7.68 national average 6.49 percent 
That's the 2023 Q1 CoStar data. So I think one thing we might benefit from, and I hope we can find some of these deals, is a property, maybe it's five years old, and it was able to push, able to grow rents, but now it looks a little bit tired, even though it's only five years old, compared to the new stuff. And it has to cut its rents a lot to compete with all these new properties, or even the new ones have to drop their rents to compete with all the new ones. And then that will be a, a buying opportunity for us where we're, we're buying on depressed rents and paying a, a, you know, a depressed price, if you will, because of those low rents. So hopefully we could use this uh, bump in supply to our advantage and pick off some deals with where they had to cut rents. But again, I think a lot of those deals aren't going to be built just with how the capital markets are right now. And construction costs have leveled off, but they're still very high. So they're not getting any relief on the construction cost side uh, when they look at their pro formas in terms of like, okay, I got to put in more equity and pay a higher interest rate. Like where am I getting any relief anywhere? And you're going, no, rents are dropping and, uh, you know, are, are flat. They're, they're not growing anymore in Austin uh, for the time being. And then, and then my construction costs haven't dropped. So maybe that's, maybe some, a lot of those projects, you know, aren't going to happen, but I think there'll still be enough where there's going to be a good buying opportunity. So excited to be here for that and get, uh, get going in Austin. And, and so what else? I think maybe what's next for Brenneman Capital. I mean, really just like what I had said, we're going to be investing in Phoenix, in Dallas, and in Austin. I think eventually we're going to open up offices in each market. So Austin's going to be the first Sunbelt office we have and the headquarters eventually. And then I, we're going to get, you know, people that are there full time in Phoenix, just as we continue to build out this, this platform. And then, um, let's see where it goes from there. I mean, the Phoenix MSA in Dallas alone, that's, you know, two of the largest, uh, MSAs in the entire country, the largest two, maybe Miami's bigger, uh, uh, but out of the Sun Belt, So we're already, um, we're in two big markets. So then I don't, I don't know if we really will need to expand beyond that um, to be able to have the deal flow we need, but we'll, who knows? I mean, I think uh, Nashville and the Carolinas look, uh, look great along with Atlanta in terms of where the markets I like, you know, Florida has uh, really good numbers, but then the whole insurance uh, situation, which we could do a whole podcast on that, but it's a very tough insurance market right now nationwide, but especially Florida, it's getting um, uh, in that it's, it's very expensive. And again, I like to have, I like to have more, uh, I like to minimize variables and know what I'm getting myself into. Just like when I was talking about the property taxes and the difficulty understanding what's going on in, in Cook County and Chicago compared to these other markets where in Florida, it's like that with, uh, with your insurance. And then obviously every, you know, whatever, five or 10 years, a big hurricane comes and, you know, it's just, a, it seems like a lot to deal with. So I'm not, uh, not sure if we'll ever get our, get going in there, but Anyways, that's that's what we're gonna be focusing on in the near term, and so I think um, appreciate y'all listening, and uh, we'll catch you on the next episode. If you learned something from today's show, leave a review and hit that subscribe button wherever you enjoy your podcast. Dive deeper into real estate investing on Brenneman Capital's website, Brenneman.com, where we have numerous free resources and information that can help both active and passive real estate investors. Accredited investors can get started today as a passive investor in our multifamily investment opportunities by hitting the Invest Now button on our website. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast are those of Drew Brenneman and guests as of the date of recording and do not purport to reflect the views or opinions of Brenneman Capital LLC and its subsidiaries. Views and opinions are provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon or deemed as investment or tax advice or an offer to buy or sell securities. The speaker cannot be held responsible for any direct or incidental loss incurred by applying any of the information offered.